why don't we kick it off and we'll see if Monsa will join. How does that sound to everybody? Today's might be a little bit, a little bit short. I, I know we probably say that um, fairly often and then it ends up not being as short, but let's we'll see how it goes. All right. So I'll start with a an icebreaker. So Sky, just so you know, we start most of the calls with an with a five minute icebreaker to let some people join late. So um, so we'll do this one. <clears throat> All right. So our icebreaker today is movie math. So I'm going to give a bunch of clues. Okay. And each clue references a movie with a number in the title. And the clue gives the plot for a fictional sequel to that movie. You need to name the movie, this, including the, the sequel movie, that is, including the new number in the title, essentially add one to the number in the original title. All right, got it? So in the example, in this Ron Howard sequel, Tom Hanks tells Houston, we have another problem as he once again fails to land on the moon. So the original movie was Apollo 13 and the fictional sequel is Apollo 14. All right, everybody got it? Okay. Good. All right, looks like Monsa is joining too. Hey, Monsa. Oh, she's still connecting. Hey, Monsa. Monsa, are you with us? Hello, hello. I am. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, well, we got you now. Um, welcome to the call. I'm always, I'm always intrigued every week to check out Monsa's background, what's going on in the background of <laughs> the screen and uh and it's it's uh it's like just a wall today so <laughs> that's very good and uh and by the way monsa sky is joining us too she lives in la so she's here as well so all right so we were just kicking off the icebreaker and it's a it's a movie math game so uh so there's a number of clues and each of the clues is to a movie that has a number in the title and then you have to guess what the what the sequel is He's basically adding one to that, right? So, all right. So that was the first clue, Apollo 13, and the sequel is Apollo 14. So here's the next one. In this sequel, unemployed actors Chevy Chase, Martin Short, and Steve Martin add another friend to their gang are invited to a different village, this time in Spain. Who wants to guess that one? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess the four amigos. Yes, indeed. The four amigos. <laughs> Everybody remembers the three amigos? All right. All right, so clue number two. In this sequel, Haley Joel Osment not only sees dead people, but also now sees just normal alive people. Who knows that one? Anybody want to guess? Oh, I forgot the name of the movie. Oh. <laughs> Who remembers it? Came out in like 2000. Any guessers? All right, I'll give it to you then. Uh, the original movie was The Sixth Sense, so the sequel is The Seventh Sense. All right. Clue number three. In this romantic comedy sequel, Hugh Grant and Andy McDowell try to recapture the old magic by attending even more nuptials and memorial services together. This one goes back. Who remembers, the, who remembers anybody remember the original movie? Something funerals. Some funeral right. Four weddings and a funeral. Oh, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so the sequel is five weddings and two funerals. All right. <laughs> Clue number four. At the start of this epic sequel, Moses has led his people to the promised land, and God summons him back to the mountaintop for one more rule. Okay, so the eighth commandment. So the original movie. Ten Commandment? Yes, the original was the Ten Commandments. Oh, okay. The sequel is the Eleven Commandments. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Next, clue number five. After finally making it big in the rap scene, Eminem returns to his hometown and runs four more laps around the track. <clears throat> nine mile. Right. It was eight mile, now it's nine mile. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, last one. In this sequel, based on a Jules Verne novel, Jackie Chan's hot air balloon gets stuck in an updraft, and it takes an extra 24 hours to circumnavigate the globe. Oh, it's um, 80 days. Um, 
uh, across the globe. Um, yes, uh, 80, 80 days across the globe. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Around the world. Just because I know the title in French because <laughs> I'm a French writer, so I didn't, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just dawned on me. It might, it might translate a little bit differently in, in the French. Yeah. All right. So around the world, maybe one day. All right, <clears throat> good. So that was our five, I think actually six minute icebreaker. So we will move on into the agenda for today. We'll do a quick housekeeping reminder. And then today is gonna to be chapter 20 on vectors. And then we'll just, uh, it's really the only big change. <clears throat> and vectors is, is was an interesting chapter because I think everybody's familiar, pretty familiar with vectors. So it's kind of hard to find something that might be new or, uh, or, or insightful. Um, hopefully I came up with a couple of things that, that might be new for everybody. So, um, all right. So uh, the, only new, the only thing to focus on on housekeeping reminders just has to do with changing, taking on one of the, the lessons. And we're gonna, um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time at the very end talking about where we go for these last few chapters and start to kind of plan out the, the, last, few, the last few things. So we'll get to that towards the end too. <clears throat> All right, on to vectors. So in the book, it talks about two types of vectors. There are um, basically an atomic vectors and lists. Okay, so it presents it presents the the vector different the different vector types in this like concentric circle graph or concentric square graph like this. Um, if you like outlines a little bit better. Here's an outline view, but the idea is this, there's vectors and then there's null values, okay? And so then within the vectors, there's atomic vectors and there's lists. And the difference between atomic vectors and lists is that atomic vectors are, hom are hom homogenous, however you say that, homogeneous, um, so that everything, that every element within the atomic vector has to be of the same type. And then on lists, they're heterogeneous. So there can be different types in, in lists. Okay? So within the atomic vectors, then there are logical vectors where every value is either true or a false. And we'll get to missing values in a second, but every value is a true or a false. There's numeric atomic vectors where everything is an integer or a double, some kind of number. And I think everybody gets the difference between integers and doubles or there's character vectors. Okay. So these are the three different kinds of atomic vectors. And then, so we'll look at atomic vectors first and then lists a little bit in a little bit more detail. All right. So under these atomic vectors, there's three possible values, true and false, and also NA. Okay. That, so a, a missing value in a logical vector, it only can take the value of NA. Um, so under numeric vectors, uh, all the numbers end up being doubles by default, okay? So even if you type in an integer, it looks like an integer to you, each of those data types is actually a double, okay? So if you want to, so you can see that right here. Uh, so the type of the number one, it might look like an integer, but it's actually a double. And if you want to make it truly an integer, you have to place an L behind the number. And so if you do the type of one L, then it's an integer. Does that kind of make sense? So I had a question about this. Okay. Um, well, this might be beyond what the book is kind of talking about, but why, why is there a split between integers and doubles? Why don't we just represent everything as a double? Um, Sometimes if there is number, you have to check out because it can be double. For example, response, um, for example, ID number, stuff like that. So maybe it's a safety. I think it might also have to do with the amount of memory that they take up. Doubles take up more memory than integers, if I'm not mistaken. That's what I was thinking is like performance wise or like database wise, like if you're like setting up a database, right? Sometimes you force the data type to integer to save space. But I mean, I wonder if that's the same thing in R 
you know, you're, it's, it's for performance wise. If you know that your value is always going to be an integer and it does not have a decimal. Yeah. But I was just wondering that when I was looking through it, I was like, why don't we just treat everything as a double? Like, why don't we give it that ability to have the decimal? But yeah, I think there might be another reason too, is the, the range of values. Well, I guess it goes back to the size of the memory that it takes up. So um, this is going to be fairly wrong, but you get the idea. So like integers can take up eight bits, whatever the number is. And so that means that they can only range from like negative 2 million, whatever, like negative 2 billion all the way up to positive 2 billion. Um, but doubles take up 16 bits. So they can range from like 80 trillion, negative 80 trillion all the way up to positive 80 trillion or, or something like that. So you have a, 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 anyway, I think there's, there's some like computer science reasons for it. Yeah. That's why I go back to like when I was first learning like SQL and like when you're like defining your table types, like this goes way beyond this, this conversation, but it's like the, the amount of numbers that you can represent. So that makes sense. Like the difference between eight bit rep and again, this might be wrong, eight bit, eight bit, and then 16 bit and the numbers that you can actually represent. So yeah. I guess that makes sense. Yeah. Anybody else have any other thoughts on Colin's question? All right. Okay. <clears throat> so then um, the other thing that came out is the, well, how you represent missing values for numeric. So you remember we said that missing values under logicals can only ever be NA. So under numerics, it can be NA, NAN, which is not a number, positive infinity or negative infinity. And the book gives some examples about how to reach each of each of these. It's like division by zero and uh, can result in some of these and, and so on. But um, I, I figured that was a little bit maybe beyond what we run into. Imagine more likely if you have a, an NA value, you're going to try to figure out how to make it not NA, but that's just me. So. All right. So then the next type of atomic vector is the character vector, and it's the most complex, which we'll talk about in just a second. And, um, and then the missing values for those are, are NA as well. All right. Good so far. Mm -hmm. All right, so then um, next we'll talk about coer coercion and test functions. So since an atomic vector must have elements of all the same data type, R uses coercion rules to accomplish this, okay? So if you have a vector three, four, five, six, all of those are numeric, and so it's going to make the, the whole vector a double. If you have three, four, five, six, and then you put in text in quotation marks, it has to convert everything in there, it has to coerce them all into text elements, right? Because even though three can either be a string or a numeric value, the word text can never represent a numeric value. And so it has to coerce them all to one or the other. And so it's gonna coerce all of them to uh, to, to strings. And then there's some test functions, some ways that you can find out what your vector is. So is logical, uh, will capture anything that's logical. News numeric will capture all integers and doubles. If it's atomic, it will capture all of these. And then if it's a, you know, if it's a vector, it'll capture everything in this list. So, so there's these functions out, the, out there so that you can check to see what, uh, what kind of of values are inside of your vector. Cool. All right, so this came up very timely. This came up this for me this week as I was trying to do something, learning this, this lesson right here was very timely. So here's what I was trying to do. I had a data element, I had a, sorry, I had a column here and some data and it had both string values and numeric values, say names and salaries or whatever. And I wanted to test if this is a number or like what to find out if this value right here was either a number or a character string and then move on to the next one. Is this a number or a character string, number or character string, number or character string, okay? And so I used 
is numeric to try to test. Like I passed a vector is numeric to, to this function and I tried to have it determine, I was expecting it to say like true, 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 false, false, true, or whatever. Does anybody want to take a stab as to why it didn't work or what was the output when you, if you pass this vector to the function is numeric, what's going to be the outcome and why? Because you're asking it for the entire vector, so it'll just give you character. Right, exactly right. So if I used it is numeric, the result was just a single value of false because the vector is not a numeric vector. And it's not a numeric vector because it has at least one string value in it, which converted everything to a string and made the whole vector a string. So is numeric is not gonna work if you wanna find out each individual item one by one. So that was, that was a, a learning moment for me. Any comments or, or questions on that? So what I ended up having to do was to use a stringer function to, to pull out, I used a regular expression to identify whether the very first character of each item was a string or a number. One second, please. Hmm. So, well, I guess while Ryan's uh, <laughs> while Ryan's managing the the people in the crowd, uh, they come in and they ask me if they can have a snack. Like, what? No, you can't have a snack. Like, yes. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> uh, healthy snack. Uh, um. So then, so then, would we say? Okay, so then. Would we say is underscore numeric not vectorized is what we would say? Is it like, that's what I'm trying to wonder is, or am I like way off base? It's a good question. And I'm, and I'm not sure I understand exactly what it means to be vectorized or not. But I think that's, I think that's the idea is if it's vectorized, it can look at each element of a vector and make a determination on it. And if it's not vectorized, then it maybe it looks at the whole vector as a whole. I'm, I'm not sure on, on those. So if anybody wants to clarify, go for it. Because in my mind, while you were talking there, I was thinking like if we had a tibble, like if we had, you know, because the tibble is just a bunch of vectors put together, right? That's basically all a tibble is. So then if you passed that tibble through is underscore numeric, then would it return like uh, a true or false for each element or each vector in that tibble because then it would be vectorized right it would just depend on and yeah. maybe i'm getting maybe i don't really totally understand the definition of vectorized but that's what i would think would happen but i'm not sure i think in this case it's, it's numeric if it's vectorized and we pass a uh, pass four elements to it if it's vectorized it will return four four like uh four 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 but if it's not vectorized, it will only evaluate the first element. So in this case, is if it's not in this case, I, mean, I think it's not vectorized because it only give one force. So it will evaluate only the first element, John Doe, and it, it's a uh, it's a character. So it give us the answer force. Yeah. And that's the understanding of vectorized and uh, and uh, and not vectorized. If it's vectorized, it means it can take a vector and, keep, and evaluate every element. If it's mm. not vectorized, it means that you will only evaluate the first element. Mm. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So like if this was like, okay, I see what you're saying. So if this was, well, okay. And maybe in my mind, I'm not 100% on what vectorized is, but it would make sense, right? If you passed in that vector, you know, it should go step by step for each row within that vector, for each element within that vector, and then it then that function would be considered to be vectorized. Yes. But but because of coercion rules, because of the coercion rules, that vector, every element in that vector needs to be the same type. So. Okay. Yeah. But I guess the thing that I'm getting kind of mixed up too is what if you expanded it 
you know, to a tibble. Like if you had like four different elements in a tibble, like four different vectors, because the tibble is just a, a thing of vectors. Yeah. Would it give you a like true, true, false, false kind of thing is what I'm thinking. So can you see my R screen? I can, yeah. Okay. So if we do like my tibble and I have column A, I should have done this in R markdown, but um, let me see if I can just switch it over there. Um, new file, new... Do I do a new notebook or just a new R markdown? Ah, uh, you do notebook, but you can do it in this too. Uh, We're just experimenting with it. I'm just, I'm just wondering. Yeah. And I could explore it a little bit later too. I was just wondering what would happen if you pass like a tibble through. Okay, so there's my my tibble. All right, so there we have column A is a double, column B is a is a character vector. Mm -hmm. All right, and so then if we do is numeric for my tibble. That is false. Okay. So I wonder if it's looking at the whole entire the whole entire tibble and saying it can't be a numeric because because column B is not numeric. So if we say is character my tibble. Also false. Hmm. So let's see if we change column B instead of being these. Um, we say that eight, nine, ten, zero, uh, 50, 10, and 11. Okay, so now we have two numeric vectors. <clears throat> so that also says false. Is numeric is also false, and his character is also false. Um, Can you put my my tipo and then a uh, dollar sign, uh, column A, and uh, try just try like one of the elements and then see how it goes. Yeah. Okay, so that's true. And then column B is also going to evaluate to false. Column false is evaluating to false. Why? Oh, because it's is character, and you converted it into a numeric. Numeric, yeah. Okay. <laughs> we're asking the question. Well, that's why. Okay. <clears throat> okay. That's true. Hmm. And so, I think, I, I think in this case, they only evaluate the first element. For example, if if you change nine to like a character, I think you will give you like true. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we think this is going to evaluate to true? I think so. Uh, uh, it should evaluate to false, right? Because the coercion rules would basically say that because you put cat oh, a string. Oh, right, 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 you are right. Cat, it, will eval it should evaluate. I mean, I could be wrong too. <laughs> no, no, no. Yeah, I, th oh, I didn't think about this. That, yeah, you are right. It will co a, a will co coerce to, uh, to character. So it will, it's going to give you a false. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I don't understand why is the entire thing not like is 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 the table supposed to have some character of its own? That's a good question. I don't know the answer. So the way I understand a tibble is a tibble is like a list of vectors, right? Mm -hmm. So it's a list of vectors. So every column in a tibble is is essentially its own vector. So that's why I was wondering if essentially if you were using like is underscore numeric, yeah, would it go through as like this is list element one, which is this column, list element two, which is this column, but um, maybe I'm just confusing myself more than anything. But well, let's check in a second. So we were, we were about to evaluate this one is numeric column B and everybody thinks that this is going to evaluate to false. Does anybody want to put money on it? <laughs> Not that confident, but yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so that evaluated to false as we expect. So I think it's it's what we said because it has cat in here, the whole vector evaluated to a string. Yeah. And so that okay. So now let's change it all to numeric again. So we should get true on this one and true on this one. But then like Monza was asking, if we say is numeric on my tibble comes out as false. Yes. Can I try is is vector and is list for my tibble? So 
Oh, check is is less. Did you say? Yeah, and and is Victor. Yeah, it, because my table is a list, but but is uh, the. That's interesting. Okay, so only so you can't you can't get more this more traditional data type at a at a table level, only at a vector level. Yeah. Okay. But I think if we expand it with going into next week, I bet if we put this into a map function and had it iterate over, I think it yes. would test each vector in the list if we put it in like a map function, but that's that's next week. So yeah, that's exactly what, what I think. If we use the map function, it will give us like true, 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 true. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right, good. Any other questions? Okay, kind of cool to explore that. All right, on to the next one then. So as we're talking about vectorized functions, um, maybe this can help answer that question. I also forgot that we had this slide. So, uh, so um, when we're talking about vectorized, vector, we have vector one, two, four, six, eight, ten, 10, and vector two, three, five, seven, nine, eleven. And because they're vectorized, you can put vector two minus vector one, and it automatically matches these these items up one by one and gives you gives you the result there. Um, the other half of I, I think everybody's familiar with that concept, right? You probably live and live and breathe that one day, every day. Um, when it comes to recycling rules, um, the other part of recycling rules is that uh, if if one of the vectors is shorter than the other it'll recycle those, just to be able to keep iterating through them one after another, as long as the shorter one is a multiple of the longer one. So in this case, we have vector one has five elements and vector two only has two elements. So it starts to do this, two minus three, four minus five, and then it recycles this one, six minus three, eight minus five. You can see here, three, five, three, five, but then it gets to this last one and it doesn't know what to do. And so this actually generates an error. Oh, how come? Um, because it, 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 because it doesn't know it's because it's not going to complete the recycle, the recycle operation, whatever you want to call it of this, of this vector. Oh, it has to be complete. Yeah. So maybe we should, maybe we should test this just to make sure that I'm not crazy. I'm going to make this six, seven. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm going to make it only five long. And I'm not going to, I'm going to take it out of the tibble. And it's just going to be, we'll just call it column A, meaning vector A. And we'll try this is, instead of being column B. Okay. And we'll make this too long. So this is five elements long. This is two elements long. Okay, column B, we'll get rid of that, we'll get rid of all this. So if we do um, column A minus, <clears throat> actually what I'm going to do first is I'm going to make these the same length so that we can uh, one, two, three. And make them the same length so that we can see how they vectorize together, right? Yeah, so column A minus column B, 2 minus 8, 3 minus 9, 4 minus 1, 5 minus 2, 6 minus 3. Okay, no problem. Mm -hmm. So now if we change this one <clears throat> to a length of 2 and try column A minus column B, you get this error. Longer object length is not a multiple of shorter object length. So is this so this maybe this is just a warning though, is it? This is just a warning because it actually did two minus eight, three minus nine, four minus eight, five minus nine, six minus eight. Okay. So it's just a warning. It's not a it doesn't fail out. Does that everybody see that? Because it still does complete it. Yeah. Okay. So it tries, but then it it only does the first one and then gives you that warning. Okay. <clears throat> so there you go. And then yes, 
this one would complete without any problems because the three would just recycle all the way down. Cool. All right. What? I, I thought, oh, like, go ahead, Sky. Go ahead, Sky. Oh, sorry. I, I just saw that in that, like in, in example we see, so we have a five and a two number here. In this case, 10 will be minus three. Right. 10 would be minus three. Yeah, I put minus question, question, question mark because um, I did it wrong. Oh, oh yeah, never mind. It's just <laughs> <laughs> I went a little bit fast on the experiment of that, and I, I only saw the, the error note. I didn't notice that it was actually a warning instead. So. Okay. No problem. Colin, isn't, isn't, there, isn't there something, though, like, I remember reading it in the chapter where it was, like, something with, like, the dplyr verbs or something that it won't allow you to do that if there isn't, a, like, a, like, if it isn't, like, a multiple of it or something, and maybe I'm missing something, but... Yeah, that's that's right. So I think there is some uh, there's like a, a dplyr version to it. Um, so let me think if uh, what could we do here for let's say that we do like a mutate. Yeah, no, this is it. So like if you try to make it if you try to make a tibble with like differing vec like with vectors with different lengths it will error out and tell you that Tibble columns must have compatible sizes. So if you try to do like Tibble, X equals one through four, something like that, and then comma Y equals one through two, it will error out. So like if you just do it in the Tibble, so like if you, if you just do Tibble, so Tibble, and then inside Tibble define a vector called like X, X equal or column X, yeah, equals, you know, one colon four. So like one, yeah. one colon four. And then you did like column Y equals one colon two. That would work though, right? It won't work because, oh yeah, we have this, the, the function will, well, it will error out. So if you close your parenthesis and then try and run that, you'll get an error that basically says that you have to have it, they have to be matching sizes. So it's not gonna do the recycling, the way I understand it, it's not gonna do the recycling rules if you try and define a tibble this way. Okay. Did it not? Oh. No, it, it did when I changed it to just one. And when I had anything, when I had one to two, mm -hmm. it, you're right, it did say that. Tibble columns must have compatible sizes column Y, only values of size one are recycled. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't get the logic. If, you, if you put one, then it's doing, but I mean, if, if you do one, two, then also it should do. I think that's should what be it- able to recycle it. You, you would think that it could recycle the one and the two, one, two, right? You, you would think yeah. that, but I, I think it's just something that they built into into deep fire. I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ryan. That it won't even recycle even multiples. Uh, I was just why looking at- recycling one? I don't get that. Uh, but what you say, why is it recycling one like yeah, this? Yeah. I think one is the only one, is the only time that it will recycle it. Okay. It won't recycle the multiples like we did with, you know, with column A and column B. Because this is just this is just base um, this is just base R stuff. I think the tidy verb, but the 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 tidy verse has the special recycling where it'll only recycle it if it's one one value. Oh, this is interesting. Yeah, and um, probably very hard to keep track of. Well, that's why, that's why I think, because I was just rereading that section in the book real quick, and it says, it says something about that, um, you know, this is kind of behavior that you can do really clever things with, but sometimes it's silent and it conceals itself. And so the reason why Tibble forces this behavior or forces the structure to be the same length of vectors and doesn't recycle is so that it's explicit that you know that these aren't the same length, so you don't have any issues in your data set. 
is what I understand. But I, I understand what Monsa saying is, is why would it do it? Why would it do the recycling rules for just one value rather yeah. than, you know, multiple? Uh, <laughs> good point. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Write a letter to your congressman on that one. I, I don't know. Um, but it's, it sounds like it's one of those things that you just have to remember, you know, how, it, how it's going to handle. Cool. Any other questions or thoughts on that one? All right. So that's recycling. And then uh, we get into subsetting. Subsetting. This was this was eye opening for me too. So uh, I think all of us have encountered subsetting. I wonder if anybody has taken the time to really dive into it and, and get it straight in your mind. So let's try to do that if you haven't yet. So. So there's a number of ways to subset things and you can subset vectors like X here. You can subset them using uh, with an integer vector. Okay. So you can see here, this is our vector X and we're going to subset it with a vector. This vector in here, C three, two, five. And everybody's familiar with subsetting using these square brackets, right? Everybody knows that that means subsetting. Okay. So, so if you use an integer vector, then you can pull out elements three, two, and five. Okay, no problem. You can duplicate, um, you can duplicate elements by just um, subsetting, like including them in your subsetting. So here we have one, one, five, 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 two. Same thing, you know, it pulls out, uh, pulls out those elements there. If I'm going too fast on this, everybody stop me because I'm, I might be making some assumptions that this is already familiar. So if we need to go over it some more, it's totally fine. Um, you can remove values from the base vector using negatives. So if your subsetting vector is negative one, negative three, and negative five, then it'll leave you just with two and four. But oh, don't ever make- I didn't get this one, the negative one. You, you don't get it? No. So if we, if the base vector is this one and it's it's the string of one, two, three, four, and five, you can use the negatives to drop out. It's like X, but drop out element number one, drop out element number three, and drop out element number five. Oh, okay, got it. And so then you're left with just two and four. Um and it says not to ever combine positives and negatives. Um, so I guess it wouldn't really know. It would be like, so wait, you want me to include number one and also drop number one? So that would, that would be confusing. <clears throat> and then it also says that you can always subset with the, just the number zero and it returns a zero length vector. To quote the book, it's not very, it's not useful very often, but it is there and can be used for testing functions. So, so how is everybody good on this? Makes sense. So this is just different ways to subset using an integer vector. Okay. All right. The next one then is subsetting with logical vectors. Okay. I thought this was interesting too. So if we do this, if we take this vector right here, vector is called X. And it has these elements, 10, 3, NA, 5, 8, 1, and NA. And if you do the function not is NA, that's going to produce a vector of true and false. True, true, false, true, 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 false. Okay. You could also pass this logical vector into X and it would give you the elements that, that are true. So it would give you 10, 3, 5, 8, and 1 because the ones that are not NA are 10, 3, 5, 8, and 1. So to combine those two, this, uh, this expression, not is NA, generates this vector, and then it extracts all the true values there. Okay. So this is almost using a, a, using a formula or a function to generate a logical vector is no different than just hard coding in the vector itself. Okay. All right. And then subsetting vectors with character vectors using names. So we've looked at using an integer vector in the subset, a logical vector in the subset, and you can also use a character vector in the subset as long as your vector elements have names. And so 
um, I don't know if you've ever done this. I think it's probably maybe a little unusual to just create a vector, but to actually name each element of the vector. ABC is one, DEF is two, and XYZ is five, and it creates a vector. Even though this looks like a table, it's just a vector with names. Okay. And then you can pass those names in your subsetting vector, XYZ, DEF, and then you get, you get those back, the ones that are named XYZ and DEF. Okay. And if you try to subset using a column that doesn't exist, then you get an NA. Okay, cool. All right. All right, so then we get into lists. Now in the book, there's an analogy to help, to help formulate the idea of lists and it uses a pepper shaker. Did you guys see that one in the book at all? That helped me zero. The, the analogy that helped me understand this better is this analogy of a train, okay? And let me just read what it says in there um, in, from the book. Actually, I take that back. This is not from our book. This is from, I should have linked it in here, but this is from a different book called Hands On. It's another intro book. But anyway, that book says, imagine that each list, e imagine that each list is a train and each element is a train car. When you use single brackets, R selects individual train cars and returns them as a new train. Each car keeps its contents, but those contents are still inside a train car, i.e. a list. When you use double brackets, R actually unloads the car and gives you back the contents, okay? I don't know if this helps, but let me try to explain it a little bit. Um, if you've seen a list, has everybody, has everybody seen a list? Kind of, okay. So lists, I made a list right here and it's called big list. And it has three elements. Element number one is called alpha, and it's a data frame with columns called column A and column underscore B. The second element of the list is called element Bravo, and it's a vector of numbers. And then the third element is, uh, is a function, and it's ele the, the element name is Charlie, and it's a function, okay? So I created it this way, big list, and then you start it by making a list. The first element, like I said, is alpha, and it's a data frame, has column A, one, three, five, column B, two, four, six. The second element is named Bravo, and it's just a string of, of numbers. It's a, it's a numeric vector, 10 through 60, okay? Now, importantly, well, you will see it in a second. And then the third one is named Charlie, and it's a function called where it takes in an integer value and it adds 10 to it, okay? No big deal. When you create the list, it looks like this. The name is listed here next to a dollar sign. And this, so the first element is named alpha. You can see column A, one, three, five, column B, two, four, six. Importantly, this is two by three, or it's three by two, I guess, rows by columns. So it's a three by two data frame. This is just a vector of, with six elements. The shape is, is not, it's not the same shape as, as element alpha. Element bravo is completely different. It's a vector. It's not a data frame either. Um, and then Charlie is a function. It's not even a list of numbers or a table or anything like that. It's a, it's a function completely independent of itself. Okay. Now, when I think about this train analogy, the, the engine for me, corresponds with these names. It's like, if it has a name, then it has an engine, it has a train car, and, um, and, and it's a list, okay? Even if it's a list with just one element, okay? So as the example gives you here, it's a, it's a train car, I mean, it's, a, it's an engine, it's a list with, the, with three elements, a vector, C1 uh, and two, a logical value and then a, a character value. The whole thing is one list. And then there, then the subsetting begins, okay? And with the single square brackets, it pulls out the first element of the train, but it leaves it as a train. It's still a list. If you use the double brackets, it gets rid of the train. There is no engine. It just, and it, it unloads the car, and now you're looking at what's actually inside the, the, the car, okay? 
so far so good. This was like, this was a major learning for me. So maybe you guys already got this, but this is, this was a, a breakthrough for me today as I was going through this concept. All right. So as we, if we move on then, um, let me see, what was I going to, what was I going to do here? All right. So, so using big list, if, if I do big list with single brackets one, what gets returned? So here's a, yeah, so this is like a, a quiz. Big list, single brackets one, what gets returned? Alpha, Alpha right. With, and it's still list, it has the name, so it has the engine, and so you get the whole thing as an as a list, as an element, as a. Um, we're not we're not to the to the lower level. We're not at the data frame level yet. Okay. But big list with double square brackets returns the data frame itself. Okay. No title. No engine. We're at the data frame level. Okay. All right. So moving on then, big list. Two with single brackets, you can imagine what it returns. Returns the second element with the title. So it's it's over here. It's the whole it's the element of the list. Okay. But with the double brackets, now we finally get down to the vector and we can manipulate the vector. Okay. All right. So next one, this is why it was important. If you do big list three, what do you get? Same thing as before. You get the whole entire function, but it's still a list. It still has the name. It still has the engine, right? If you do big list with two square brackets, now you're actually at the function level and you can actually engage with the function itself. So if you do big list with double square brackets and then pass in the value eight, you get 18 because you're, you have you have accessed the function within the list, so you can actually pass values to it. But if you try to pass eight to big list with single square brackets, you're still just at the list level. It's a single item list, and you get an error: attempt to apply non-function because okay? you can't pass eight to a list. Not until you break it down to the to the function level. So I don't know if that helps anybody, but I have always had to think hard about lists, and um, and this this helped me today to get get past that. So um, any thoughts or comments on that? And if you want to say, Ryan, we knew this two years ago, that's a valid comment, and I welcome it. No, I was never really able to distinguish the single bracket and the double bracket. I, I, today I learned something new. Yeah, good. good. Yeah, I think this was, I, I like the train analogy. That one works really well. It's a lot better than the salt and pepper shaker. Right. Um, but I was also thinking about just an idea that popped in my head was I never, I never really thought about passing a function into a list. And so, but that's kind of nice because if you had a lot of functions that you wanted to apply to an object, you know, or a list of objects, I mean, that, I mean, that just has a lot of flexibility. Like if you expand out, because you could have as many functions in your list to perform any kind of computation on anything. And so that's, that's a pretty, that's like a pretty big concept. Like it's like, that's super flexible. So, yeah. yeah. I think I came up with, or I came across <clears throat> that concept in advanced R, just doing some research, not that I've done that book, but just kind of researching around on this. And they talk about function factories, which is that idea of putting function in one list and then functions, another function in the same list, and then you pass functions into functions. So, you know, I think there is some, there's definitely some complexity to it, but once you figure it out, probably pretty powerful. So anybody else, any other thoughts? All right. Well, hopefully that's helpful and it might give you a chance to explore around a little bit more and, and advance, uh, advance your understanding. It's going to be great. 
Okay. All right, so that pretty much wraps up everything that I wanted to cover for lists today. Anybody have any other comments or anything about what we've talked about from anything today? Going once. All right. Um, then the last thing that I'm just going to put up here is for next week and beyond. So next week, we're going to do chapter 21 on iteration. And Colin, you've got that one, right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so I don't know how many weeks you wanted to spend on that, but it's a pretty beefy chapter. There's a, there's a lot of sections to it. And I think most of the sections are pretty in depth. So <clears throat> so however many, however many weeks you want to take is fine. Um, I put up three as a proposed schedule. It may take more, it may take less, who knows. But as I was just thinking through what we might do for the rest of the book, um, we could conceivably spend the rest of May on chapter 21, which brings us to May 26th. Um, and then we get into June and we've got um, you, well, you guys can see it here. So maybe June 20, June 2nd and 9th, we handle 23, 24, June 16th, 25, um, and then 23rd and 30th for 20, chapter 27 and 28. And then we are on into July. We can do our, some more R markdown first couple of weeks in July. And then I thought GitHub maybe which puts a, a, us at possibly ending around July 21st. And then I don't know what we do once we finish the book. I don't want to just like cut it off and, and that's it. And we never see each other again. Um, so maybe we can, I don't know, do a class party. Everybody can bring cupcakes um, and, uh, or, or we can plan something else where we get together periodically. I think that would be great. Maybe like once a month or something like that. But anyway, that's in the future. Um, so this was really nothing more than just to, I guess, give you an idea that we're headed towards the end. We can plan some of these things out as best we can. And as we get into the summer months, people might be taking time off and time away. I, for one, will not be available on the 23rd and 30th. So um, it's not to say we can't just keep doing the call. I just won't be on it. Or if we wanted to break those weeks, we can. Um, I just hope that we pick it back up on the other side is the, my only fear. So <clears throat> again, we don't have to decide today, but, but this is just some, some thoughts. Maybe we can bring it up again next week as well. So with that, um, Colin, I'll, head it, I'll hand it over to you real quick. If there's anything you want to say about chapter 21 or what's your impression on it? Um, it is a pretty, it's a pretty beefy chapter, but um, I would probably think that maybe we can get it done in two weeks if we kind of condense it down. Um, I don't think there's every single concept that we need to discuss in there, but um, okay. I would say maybe two weeks. Yeah, okay. it's, it's a long chapter, but um, uh, yeah, I think that works. <laughs> and afterwards there are plenty of books <laughs> we can keep going we got a pretty good group so there are plenty of books left to go um maybe we could even do this one again right <laughs> <laughs> well second pass we could I mean. okay well good um then we'll plan on maybe two weeks for chapter 21 and and see where that puts us uh, i i happen to count up the total number of weeks that we would have been doing this um and, it, and as it is right here, it's like 31 weeks. So mm -hmm. it's somewhere around in like the 29, 30, 31 week range. Um, straight through, we haven't missed one yet. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, all right, so that's good. You always meet at six o'clock, uh, six o'clock central time. Yeah. Okay. Every Wednesday at, uh, at six o'clock central time, so. Um, Sky, if you're able, you're of course welcome every week. We'd love to have you. So. Yeah, I, I, I will come. Okay, great. Um, well, we've got a couple minutes left. And Sky, I thought maybe you could take a second and tell us a little bit more about you and what you do and, and whatever you'd like. Oh, okay. So uh, Sky is my nickname. I, uh, my legal name is Ai Chen Chen, and by other I go by Sky. Because, uh, because I feel that a person's name have a, uh, have an impact on, on a person's mood and uh, uh, characteristic. And when I hear like the name Sky, it makes me feel 
sunshine and uh, good. I live in Los, I'm currently live in uh, Los Angeles, you know, Southern California is always uh, very sunshine. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so I, I used to work in, uh, in like a, one downtown LA as a business analysis in, in like an intimate uh, lingerie before. And I mostly worked in Excel which I analyzing uh, Amazon advertisement data. I download Excel and then we analyze it. But, uh, but I found out that like R is much more powerful and, uh, and much more uh, intuitive to me compared to Excel VBA. So I, before I learned R, I tried to learn Excel VBA, but I found R is better. So that's why I, I'm trying to catch up and uh, and, and the practice and you know, join, the, join the book club. Great. Yeah. That's excellent. Um, <clears throat> so how, how would you rate your experience with R? Have you been using it just very at the very beginning or do you have a few months or a few years with it? Actually, uh, when I was at a school, when I was at school, I actually, I, I was a teaching assistant. You know, I was learning R, like the basic R, but I, because I was the teaching assistant, so, even though I had the basic knowledge of R, I already taught R for a couple of years <laughs> when I was in school. Just the basic R and also how use them how to solve solve mathematic questions. So, so that's that's I I actually taught it, but even at that time I was only have a basic knowledge. Yeah. So uh, and then I recently start to do the tidy uh, tidy uh, tidy Tuesday. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I I like it. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't talked about Tidy Tuesday very much on this, but I, I keep meaning to bring it up. Um, well, we can talk about it in a, in a future um, a future meeting, but if, you can also just Google Tidy Tuesday if you're not familiar with it. It's, it's a chance to practice everything. Um, they, every week they give you a data set and you can just explore with it. So it's, it's very helpful for practicing. So, well, that's good. Um, Thank you guys, uh, always, as always, for your participation. The last slide we always put up, that I always put up anyway, is ways to get help, questions, Google, Stack Overflow, putting questions into the Slack, office hours, our hashtag rstats on Twitter is helpful. There's, there's answer keys out there, and then, of course, the cheat sheets. So um, I guess that's really, uh, that's all I had, and I um, hope that uh, over the next couple of weeks, you guys will get some <clears throat> some time if you'd like to share some of the topics out of the book yourselves. Um, I appreciate all of your comments and insights and questions for our discussion today and we'll look forward to, to Colin's presentation on iterations next week. Thank you very well, much. And, and stay tuned and we'll see what background Monsa will have in her call when she dials in next week too. All right. Thanks everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.